So, I travelled to England. Horizon Aquatics from the UK was kind enough to invite me to do my very own workshop. This is going to be a bit different. Enjoy. Sorry, Balash. Welcome to the beautiful world of aquascaping. Yes! Hiya, guys. Thanks for coming. We know a lot of you have travelled a long way, and we really appreciate that. Um, and we want you to all enjoy this workshop, so please put your hands together for Tommy and the Green Aqua team. Well, thank you guys. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I guess not a lot of you know that this is my actual first workshop ever. Obviously, I guess most of you expect me to do an Ivakumi, so that's what we're gonna build today. Thanks for the stones for our friend Adam yep. uh, from Poland. He prepared lots of nice Frodo stones for this project. Is there a reason why you're using Power Sun Large? Yeah, I actually want to build up the height quite well for this size of tank and uh, the larger pieces help me out with that. I'm gonna go with Amazonia, actually the version two of it. Uh, to be honest, I prefer this to the old one. You have less ammonia spikes in the beginning. The old one is stable for a longer time, but in the beginning, it's easier to use this. This is actually something that I've just learned from uh, Luca Galaraga when he visited us a couple of weeks ago on his workshop, that he puts in all the soil in the very front and then pull it back with the, with the rocks, which actually I've never thought of before. It makes it much more stable. Usually I plan out my scapes uh, ahead, at least uh, the main stones I try to find. And uh, for that, obviously, the, you start with the big ones. Whatever you build, it can be an Iwagumi, it can be an NA style layout. The biggest problem most people have is not using height. What we usually aim for is, uh, we obviously know where the water level is going to be. It's different for everyone. So obviously as you're opening that bag, your supplement's dropping out. Yeah. At what stage okay. and what depth do you plant that? Usually before the last layer. So when I know that I'm just going to put one more layer of soil, that's why I put it underneath. The important thing is it needs to be covered up. So it can't be sticking out of the soil because it's uh, obviously very rich in nutrients. There's a big difference in, in that regard between aquascapers, how they usually fertilize. For example, Luca said that he doesn't do any fertilization in the first month, but he uses lots of this uh, supplement. It also depends a bit on what kind of plants you use. So for example, in vitro plants, they come from a very, very nutrient rich environment, the gel itself they grow in. So they need nutrients from the get-go, at least that's what we prefer. Uh, for potted plants, uh, you might be better off starting fertilizing after just one week, two weeks, four weeks, whatever works for you. Nowadays, it's very rare that someone builds a tank that only uses potted plants. So we switch to that side that at least some of the plants is in vitro. So in that, I would recommend starting fertilizing from day one. Now, this should be almost high enough. You're gonna move this tank back here. Okay? What, by myself? Yeah. Please <laughs> do it on Monday. <laughs> Monday. Or tomorrow after we left, okay? <laughs> Usually, you don't want to put rocks this far behind in the back of the tank because it's touching the glass basically there's no space for any plants anymore. We're gonna cheat with some moss actually so we're gonna glue Ricardia on top of it which would look like there's a carpet planted behind. Still not high enough. If for some reason you don't want to go as high or you can't but still you want it in a competition just drop the water level for the photo. Do you have a favourite hardscape material? I know obviously rocks kind of your thing, but... It's, it's rocks. Rock. Grey rocks. I, I, so Fro I, Frodo... Yeah, Frodo, yeah. Seiryu. I love wide rhino. I think it's very limited on what you can use it for. Yeah. Uh, but for minimalistic style, it's perfect. For any like proper mountainscapes, like 
this one is aimed to be. It's like a Frodo and Sairi, those are your best options, I think. What I always recommend to avoid, but some people do for height, is put in like physical things to lift the rock, like styrofoam or other pieces of rocks or whatever. That can actually block the water flow in the soil. And that's how you get uh, cyanobacteria, actually. So it usually develops from the parts where, where there is no water flow. With some things it's fine, so for example, Fuji stone, that's very good for bacteria. Do you find it hard to just stick to what you're aiming for? Because all these different aquascapers probably in here have their different ideas. Or do you try and stick traditional? Just use it as inspiration. So go with whichever style you prefer. And this is pretty far from what they call Iwagumi in Japan. Take a look and, and try to figure out what you like about them, what you don't like about them. And with the mixture of this, from all the different tanks, you can find your own style. Who is your inspiration as an aquascaper? Like, who's the other aquascaper that's your... You can say me if you want. <laughs> It's actually a very difficult topic because a lot of people I've actually met already in the workshops we've had and his friends. I don't take very much inspiration from him because he builds very different tanks. But one of the biggest coming up aquascapers right now who I'm really waiting for to get a really nice result because he deserves it is, uh, is Stephen, Stephen Chung. How many scapes have you had go really wrong? And at what point, <laughs> at what point do you try and get it to what you wanted it to be, or just ab abandon and start again? Even when you are wrong with the basic concept, you can evolve a scape quite easily uh, with plants or with more hardscape. I would say there was about two or three times in my life where I was really determined to build escape. So I had the whole thing planned out in my head. I, I built it in the dojo and then I couldn't, uh, I couldn't make it in the actual tank. This is actually something that I've, I've learned not to do anymore. So for example, today, I really just picked out the main stones. I tried to figure out which goes where roughly, and that's it. If I would put everything in place, I'm sure that I can't make it again. Sometimes I've forgot to do this. And when you start planting and you realize that half the stone is actually in the soil, that's tricky to save. Do you have any aquascapes at home, Tommy? Or, or is it just all at work? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable. Uh, actually, a few years ago, I, um, I switched my aquarium. I basically converted my aquarium into a vivarium with dart frogs because I was bored with the water changes. <laughs> what? <laughs> bored of water changes? Yeah, I think it happens to everyone. Is it any good? Yes. It is? Perfect, thank you. Frodo stones, I find they're, they're very mixed. They are very hectic in texture, color, everything. For example, the color you notice know, this one is way too blue compared to everything else. It goes away after some time. As for the textures, it's, it's really so all over the place that it, it doesn't really matter anymore. It just comes together. If you would do the same with Sirius Stone, which has really strict straight lines either way, that doesn't work. If you have a kind of hardscape that has very strict lines, then try to make them fit. But when you have something like this, it doesn't matter. There are two aspects that you look at at this point. You just look at the flow if you have it, you look at if you need height on any side, you start thinking about plants, how they're going to fit in with all this. And then you sort of look at the stones one by one for like the texture problems and so on, if you, if you see any of that. Do you ever think about the fish that you're going to keep before you scape, or <laughs> is it is it you you plop what what you want after kind of? I usually choose the fish for the scape. I look at fish in a way how they can complement it, how they can make it even better, and in that regard, you don't really care about the fish. Yeah. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, of course. Your hardscape's obviously getting to a stage where it's coming together now. We're kind of limited by budget when we choose hardscape a lot of the time. How do you know when to stop? I actually had 
uh, a contescape, which is my homescape. It was 100 by 45 by 45, which had over 100 kilos of Frodo stones inside. And I had 10 pots of plants. When I build a green aqua, especially if I build a scape like this, I try to stop myself at a point where I'm like, okay, I see spots where I could fit more rock, but let's just plant it and let's look at it in a month's time. My best result was 68, sort of a similar style, Frodo stones again. That tank, I think it's been running for only about five months before the final shot of four months. It was simple carpeting plan, so it didn't need more time. But in that four or five months, I've put in another rock almost every week. <laughs> When I said I put in the supplements of before the last layer, that goes out the window now. <laughs> yeah, but you never know. They are already inside, it's fine. Are you seeing something bigger than is contained within the glass box? Are you seeing like a, a cliff face or a canyon? Are you trying to create like a part of that, something that is smaller? I've never been able to, to take proper inspiration from from nature in that way so it's like like seeing mountains and trying to just cut it there and that's my glass I, I don't have the vision for that a lot of people can do it I'm I get much more inspired by uh, by actual aquariums and and by just playing around with the stones okay I like that one I like that one I, I sometimes I save them customers that's it yeah obviously it's, I know it's a luxury but even if secret I don't, secret stash. Yeah, secret stash. We have a bunch of. Sometimes I forget about them. <laughs> uh, now I'm, I'm actually thinking about uh, having a sand pot, but my problem is that it would make sense to have it uh, going, coming up here, uh, but it's very much in the middle. This is one of the difficulties of building from the back. You don't realize it's uh, all that is in the middle, so you might leave it without sand. You mentioned the sand path just then. Um, and actually, when you mentioned it, I was like, oh, please don't. I've, so I've got a 900, a 9 centimetre tank. And I started with a lot of Siri and sand paths and stuff. But it feels quite contrived in a way. Do you think people are going to move that way? I think the um, community is very divided in that, actually. So there are two things to, to consider here. You, you look at escape for, for its own beauty or you look at the IAPLC results, which I think a lot of people make this mistake. They decide if a tank is good based on what other people say about it. I am wondering which tank in this gallery is your favorite because there aren't really many Irigumis around, so. Yeah, well, that's weird. It's like when I look at tanks, it's not Eva Gumi is my first choice for favorites. In here, actually, that one is my favorite. Probably because we, we don't do that. So this is a style of tank that we, we've never done at Green Aqua. I'm gonna use uh, mainly three species. Uh, I'm gonna go with Alatine Hydropiper, which is one of my favorite plants. And I rarely use it in a gallery because it's really difficult to keep alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's very picky on, on temperatures. Our experience is that even when you have a, a full on carpet, if the temperature goes high, and I mean 24 degrees in the water, then it can start dying out in two, three days. It's one of the biggest mistakes we see with uh, new people in the hobby. They're having big patches of, uh, of aqua soil without plants. Uh, that's one of the worst things you can do. Um, as the floor goes over the soil, it actually breaks down these small pieces because this is clay based, so it's not, you can crush them with your hand. So as the flow goes through it, it crashes without you noticing. You're never going to see that the tank is dirty or anything like that, but you get a lot of debris uh, that starts to flow around the tank. And uh, it's a very good way to start uh, BBA infestation in the aquarium. So always cover all the soil with plants. I've noticed that you're planting your carpeting plants right at the front. Doesn't it bother you with seeing the roots of the plant? They're going to get there eventually, anyway. So, no. That one, now that you mention it, that's a much bigger problem having such a high yeah. soil in the front. Yeah. yeah, it's like what you need to make sure in the front 
is uh, you have as thick of a layer of soil as you can and have it almost perfectly flat. So, which I'm, I have no idea if it's flat now. It's not. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Haven't checked. That, that much higher than that side. Impossible. Oh, yeah, that's not nice. We're gonna fix that now because it's later on, it's gonna be a pain. Like nothing happened. Yeah. There is a small dip in the middle, which I'm gonna try to fill up now. Good quality tweezers are very strong. So if you look at it, it's difficult to flatten it out. A cheap tweezer you can easily flatten out. That means that when you actually put it in the soil with the plant and you release it, it won't open. So it will either pull out the plant or it will pull out the soil. I, especially for the strength, I like the short one because this is the strongest. I only use longer pincers if I really need to. So for example, behind this stone, if I want to plant something, it's too deep for the short one. I move over to this side and then you can go up to all the way here. Yep. So all this can be a latine. Okay, that's okay. fine. This is Charlotte, our sales representative here at Horizon Aquatics, AKA Pob. She's on uh, Instagram, plenty of betters. Based on the t-shirt you're wearing of fighting algae or algae, as you and the Americans say, <laughs> what is your best tip for fighting algae, algae? It's in understanding that there is no aquarium without algae, it doesn't exist. Proper maintenance exists proper amount of algae eaters exist and, and keeping a tank in balance. Hi Tommy. <laughs> bye bye. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I use the, the really big ones. <laughs> this is my partner Nicole. She's also a co-owner of Horizon Aquatics. I always say for most in vitro carpeting plants, if you use one pot for about the middle of your hand, it's going to take about one, one and a half months to cover. But if you plant them like this, uh, basically if you just take one pot into what eight or ten pieces, uh, this is too dense. Uh, the, the water can't flow through this properly. So the more you take them apart, it works the same as when you trim uh, your bushes outside and you trim it, you're going to get shoots out of the trimming point. You do the same when you're taking apart these plants. You, you force them to shoot. And that's why they're going to grow quicker. And also they get better flow around their roots. And I think you can build beautiful aquariums without CO2 if you accept the limitations in plants. That's a very good example. Like that's my second favorite tank in this showroom after that one. That's a no CO2 tank. For example, Monte Carlo and particularly it's Mini. These are plants for me that I say, yeah, they survive without CO2. You're never gonna get a full carpet. Now he's, he's looking for a picture <laughs> to prove me wrong. But this is not Mini. This is the long part. No, that tank's that big. Really? It's a Vio. So yeah, it happens. <laughs> In terms of CO2, at Green Aqua, you guys use the diffusers? The type of CO2 injection we use depends on the size of the tank mainly. Um, we use diffusers in the small ones like 60s and then on anything above a 90, we usually use an external reactor. Do you want to come on planting? Yeah. Feel free. This is Mark Daw, Dorryscapes on Instagram. So if this was your tank at home, what filtration would you put on it and what size would the filter be for the size tank that you've got here? When we've had 90 peas in the showroom, in the old one actually, we don't have them currently. We always ran them with, uh, with Eheim 600s. Like back then it was the professional tree for the 2075, now it's 2275, perfect. He's doing really well to say it's his first workshop, isn't he? It's mine too, actually, as well. <laughs> <laughs> For a lot of time, I used sterile carpets in Iwagumis. So just one plant in one area. And I've learned it quite quick that you, you need to mix them on the edge. But actually, it's important to just mix them about all over, not just the edge. You don't want to see 
a golf course. You, you want to see some kind of nature. Obviously, there's no point of mixing two kind of plants that are completely different on, on growing because one of them is going to win and the other one is going to disappear. Just behind this big one, I still want to see some plants and I don't only want to see the very background, I want them to stick out. I started building a scape, I said I want to cover up all this, but now that it's planted I actually like the white stuff, obviously you don't even see this from the front, but it's going to be placed in here, so uh, if you look at it from that angle it's going to be visible, but it has a nice contrast to, to all of it. We're done, thanks for Horizon for having me. Thank you for coming. Perfect first workshop for me. So that was it. Huge thank you to Horizon Aquatics and the guys over there. It was a great experience to have my very own, very first workshop. And see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>